Many of us want to be faster, stronger, and leaner. And the food industry has done a fantastic job in telling us that one of the keys to this is to consume protein. Protein, everything. But how much protein do we actually need? Well, in this video, I'm gonna put my science glasses on and tell you what the current latest scientific literature says on the matter. And yeah, I've spent the last week locked in a library so that you wouldn't have to. Let's begin with a poll. I'm keen to know how many of you immediately try and slam down some protein after you've finished a workout to try and boost your recovery. Simple yes I do or no I don't. Click down below and you can vote. Protein is everywhere these days and in 2017 we spent 9.4 billion dollars worldwide on whey protein alone which is astounding and food brands are slapping protein this and protein that on well everything in a bid to make us buy it it's almost as if that you can put protein on any chocolate bar or item of junk food and then it kind of gives us this carte blanche that we can buy it and eat it as if it's now healthy now you can probably tell from my sarcastic tone that no it's not junk food is junk food but protein is crucial for growth and repair of our bodies and muscles but how much do we need well before i get on to that here's the science of how protein works how does your body build muscle well it has two options hyperplasia which is the creation of new cells or hypertrophy which is making your existing cells stronger and well once you're fully grown your body can't create new muscle cells unless of course you inhabit the marvel universe which means that you rely on hypertrophy how does this work well when viewed under a microscope muscle cells are made of protein-based fibers called myofibrils and when a muscle cell builds more of these fibers it gets bigger and stronger think of it kind of like a piece of string turning into a piece of rope cyclists are mainly concerned with getting stronger rather than getting bigger but to achieve this you need to have muscle protein synthesis to be greater than muscle protein breakdown and you can do this by performing resistance training on your muscle cells, which can be in the form of cycling, and then intake of protein from your diet. Now, if you're a bodybuilder like me, or uh, you wanna have massive guns like me, then increased levels of protein will help you uh, achieve your goals. But the limiting factor in most cycling performance, in most areas of cycling, isn't muscle size, it's your cardiovascular system. And despite what certain people uh, within the sort of keto diet community may preach, the science is clear. Your cardiovascular system will run optimally when fueled by carbohydrates. A key piece of advice is that carbohydrates are absolutely key and crucial to performance in endurance cycling. And just to clarify, endurance cycling includes anything from sort of a four minute individual pursuit on the track, right up until like, you know, Tour de France stages and beyond. And you should be careful to not let your carb intake suffer because you're proportionally eating too much protein protein that you probably don't even need and your body can't even make use of why i'll explain that now in terms of overall protein intake and what's optimal the most comprehensive scientific literature is probably in the form of a meta-analysis published in the british medical journal in 2018 then updated in 2020 and for those of you who aren't science nerds and are going what's a meta-analysis well it's where you combine all of the data from a number of independent studies on the same subject in order to try and see if there are any overall patterns in the data and how robust those studies are and if you can draw solid conclusions by looking at that wider data set. And this particular meta-analysis actually combined 49 randomized controlled studies looking at resistance training and protein intake. The conclusion was that increased protein intake led to increased strength increased muscle size and increased lean body mass bonus but this was to a point i mean it's not like you can just infinitely eat more and more protein and get infinitely hench 
No, it, it doesn't work like that, which is quite funny, seeing as I'm dressed as Bruce Banner right now. The results suggest that if you consume more than 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day, you don't actually see any benefit to that. You can consume more protein if you really want to. Just be aware that the most comprehensive and up-to-date scientific research suggests that it's going beyond our nutritional requirements of our body and will literally end up just being flushed down the toilet. Or Danny if you're in Australia. There is a caveat though, in that this meta-analysis was performed on strength training. You know, like <laughs> gym stuff. And uh, well, the demands of cyclists are, are quite different. So for example, if you went on a really long ride and you depleted your carbohydrate stores, perhaps you even bonked halfway through, then your body can turn to its protein that's in the system and use that as fuel. Protein is nowhere near as good a fuel as carbohydrate in your body, but it can still use it. And therefore, by using some of the protein for fuel rather than for growth and repair, you may want to perhaps up your protein intake a little bit after your ride to compensate for the protein that you burned as fuel. Increasing your protein intake to 1.8 grams or two grams uh, per kilogram of body weight per day isn't likely to do you any harm. High protein diets are no longer considered harmful to our kidneys. Worst case scenario, the excess protein is excreted, like I mentioned earlier. You'll just get rid of it in the rest room. Um, just don't eat 30 steaks. However, in most situations, if you're properly fueled with carbs for your workouts and your, your riding, then this shouldn't be an issue. So now we know the amount of protein, what does that look like? Well, if we take that upper limit of consumption for sort of you know, hard training athletes, 1.6 grams per kilogram a day, at 68 kilograms, that would be 108 grams of protein for me. And it could look like this. For breakfast today, I ate porridge, my favorite. Mm. Now there's protein in the oats and the milk, but also the nuts and seeds I had with it. And if you wanted to top it up with extra protein, you could add some natural yogurt to it as well. And in total, for me, this works out as about 30 grams of protein per serving. Then if I were to go for a ride or you know, do some training, then I wouldn't really focus on consuming much protein. I might get a trace amount or a little bit here and there in the odd energy bar, but my main focus is going to be on carbohydrate consumption and making sure I'm properly fueled. And to do this, I'll have a combination of sports drinks, perhaps uh, some energy bars, and then maybe even some gels. Although I tend to only really use gels when I'm racing. For lunch, well, I had a mushroom risotto and a, and a side salad as well, just you know, get some uh, micronutrients in there. And this contained around 120 grams of carbs and 30 grams of protein. Lots of vitamin D in there as well. And this is basically why I do endurance exercise, so that I can eat more carbs. And for dinner, keeping it vegetarian or perhaps even vegan, I'm having a lentil and chickpea curry. And with the, you know, lentils and chickpeas providing protein and then any other vegetables as well, that I also uh, choose to include, I'm easily getting 30 grams of protein in a portion. Without even trying, and by being mostly vegetarian, you can see I'm already at 90 grams of protein. I'm pretty much there. So once you throw in a few snacks, perhaps a, a protein bar or you know some nuts or maybe you know even just milk could be a, a dairy alternative as well, just in hot drinks throughout the day, you can see how it's pretty easy to hit that 1.6 grams figure. And remember, if you're not as physically active, if you're not doing as much physical activity, then 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight would be absolutely sufficient. And you can see from this how easy it is for most Western diets to get enough protein without really trying. You can, of course, use protein supplements to top up your protein as and when you require it. And they have the great advantages of being very quick, convenient, and they have a long shelf life. And it can be really useful if you finish a race or a ride and you know, you're not near home, but you still want to get some protein in. And if you are gonna use protein supplements, we would recommend that you only use you know, good quality, trusted ones. It kind of goes without saying, but you know, brands like Enovit have been supporting top athletes for you know, over 40 years. 
If you're unsure how much protein you're consuming in your diet, well, consider just looking at food labels and totting it up, or you could perhaps use a, a tracker app to do that, that's pretty useful. And the take home message here is that with a little research and planning, you can easily get the protein that you need and you don't need an omnivorous diet in order to do so. You know, research suggests that there is absolutely no difference in plant or animal protein when it comes to building muscle. So, um, well, get it where you like. But wait, what about that crucial post-workout 30-minute protein intake recovery window. If I don't make that, then I ain't gonna get those gains. But actually, that's probably not true. Uh, another myth busted. Another more detailed look at the scientific literature. This meta-analysis suggests that while consuming protein is really important for, for muscle growth, and muscular adaptation, the sort of window of opportunity isn't as narrow as we once thought. Muscles are sensitive to protein intake as much as 24 hours after exercise. The meta-analysis also concludes that timing of your pre-workout meal is key to determining your protein needs after. So if you ate protein before working out, you don't need to worry so much about slamming it in as soon as you finish training. Whereas if you're training fasted, so you didn't eat anything before it, then having some protein straight after is likely to be more beneficial. But for maximum gains, uh, the analysis suggests that consuming protein before and after your workout, around 0.4 to 0.4 grams uh, per kilogram of body weight in those sittings, um, spaced around four to six hours apart, is probably optimal. Speaking of uh, maximum gains, um, I should probably do one on this arm because just uh, I've got to be balanced out. So, <coughs> yeah. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful and informative. And if you have, then please give it a thumbs up as it really does help. And if you'd like to know more information about being more plant-based in your diet, you don't have to, um, but if you do, then why not check out our plant-based cyclist cookbook? Um, it may be of interest to you. And let us know your comments down below on protein intake. And in the meantime, I'm gonna head off in search of more gains. Oh yeah. <laughs>